I'm working at the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology in Crete and uh, in my lab who are working on uh, DNA repair and genome maintenance. So since the 60s there have been many and important discoveries about uh, uh, DNA repair and there have been many important advances from transgenesis down to the omic sciences but even today we can hardly explain how exactly and why the patients that carry mutations in DNA repair pathways they have all these complex phenotypes. And so we're focusing our work on one pathway which is quite complicated. It's the nucleotide excision repair and involves about 30 proteins or so. And what's so fascinating about this pathway is that you can have mutations in that same mechanism that can give rise to uh, patients with enhanced cancer predisposition and yet you can have other patients with other mutations in the same pathway that can make the people aging faster. But surprisingly, they get no cancer. And so to study these patients, we and others have generated a number of mouse models, and some of them, they get developmental defects, some others aging faster, and others they get skin cancer if it happens that you expose them to UV radiation. And so what I would like to talk to you about is uh, the most recent work in a lab that was done by, by a PhD student, a very good PhD student, Ismini Karkasidoti, which she was actually asking why patients in mice carry defects in nucleotide excision repair, they actually lose fat. And so to study this, she used the Crelox P recombination technology to restrict the repair defect only in the white adipose tissue. And so if you do that, what happens is that you get mice that are actually uh, uh, pretty much like the wild types, they're indistinguishable, they can breed, they have a normal developmental uh, 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 line, but then a few months after they start losing fat. And here you can see on the left lower panel uh, the fat loss and also in the middle you can see the brown adipose tissue called BAT and surrounding by white adipose tissue which actually is gradually uh, lost. And then also you see that you have the uh, loss of fat in the skin. Now, we're very happy that we have a good electron microscope in, in uh, the University of Crete. So if you look on the pictures here, what you see is normally a white adipose tissue is like a fat bag full of adipocytes, which are not particularly attached in any particular way, one to the other. And so what we have seen is that there is a rupture of basement membrane, and then the adipocytes are fall off, leaving behind some empty cavities. And then what you see is the reappearance of cilia because they, the adipose tries to increase the surface tension and so uh, regenerate the tissue and then you see also responses of wound healing. And now we have done a lot of gene expression studies to try to find out what's happening and we saw that there are three major biological processes which are overrepresented. That is a response to double strand breaks, a response to pro-inflammatory signaling and nuclear receptor signaling. And the same biological processes and the same genes would go up or down significantly. You could see it in the most classical model for lipodystrophy, which is the PPR gamma knockout mice. And so we start from double strand breaks and we use a number of markers and we found out that there was indeed uh, 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 we, we found FOSI for gamma 2x and Fanconia and RAT51 and Phospho-ATM. And all these are signaling a, a proper DNA damage response. And what was really exciting was that ATM, which normally is a nuclear protein and is supposed to sense the damage, was actually in the cytoplasm. Now, if you see on the lower panel uh, uh, of the figure, you can see actually the ATM is surrounding the cytoplasm. And originally we thought this is, this is something wrong, but then we found out uh, there was a science paper back then in the same year showing that ATM and NF-kappa beta interact in the cytoplasm to, to trigger an innate immune response, which was really uh, uh, great. Now, surprisingly, we didn't find any apoptosis, but we found uh, a necrosis. And we also saw the appearance of dumps, the damage-associated molecular pattern molecules, which are alarming, and they are supposed to express in the surface and the signal to the microenvironment that cells have a compromised state. So this is a, a stressful signal. So, if we move to the inflammation, we found out that there was a recruitment of leukocytes at sites of damage. Now, normally you see these crown-like structures where an adipocyte which is about to die is surrounded by macrophages, and we knew they are macrophages because they would stain positively for Mach 1 and Mach 3, which are antigen-specific macrophages, and a subset of those they would also express uh, um, uh, INOS and CD45, VCAM and ICAM, which are all molecules, markers for pro-inflammatory signaling. But the most important of all would be like, would have also an upregulation, both at the protein and RNA level of uh, interleukins like 6 and 8 and TNF-alpha. So for us, the question was, how do you start from DNA damage 
and you end up into the transcription or upregulation of cytokines. Well, what's happening at the mechanistic level? So we had to carry this in vitro by developing in vitro assays such as the one you see here, where we take MEFs, mouse embryonic fibroblasts, and we expose them to a, a adipogenic cocktail and we make them look like adipocytes. So they accumulate fat and they become well differentiated and functional adipocytes and they express all the markers and what we have seen is that if you expose these guys to mitomycin which is a, a, a genotoxin that in, uh, in triggers uh, DNA intestine cross links or you, you have a repair defect then you will see immediately the transcriptional uh, upregulation of the three cytokines I was looking I was talking to you about, the TNF alpha and the two interleukins. And so we found out that this is mainly through a, first of all a chromatin modification. So you have repressive modifications, right, like the trimethyl uh, lysine uh, 9 or for example others which are replaced for uh, activating ones. So then uh, transcription factors can have access to the promoters. Is this though enough? No it's not. So what happens is that you have to actually remove a repressor complex from the promoters of those cytokines. And so you are talking about a transcriptional derepression. So you normally the promoters of the cytokines are poised for transcription. But then what happens is that in response to an, a, a nerve defect or in response to DNA damage, the, actually the repressor complex is released from the promoters and this is the second uh, requirement for transcriptional of the cytokines at sites of, of tissue damage. So if uh, the whole thing uh, uh, I have to say it also depends on DNA damage signaling. So if you would use an inhibitor for ATM, diataxia, telangiectasia, mutated protein, then the whole thing is actually cancelled. So if I go back and do a summary uh, of the whole thing, you restrict an artifact to the wide adipose tissue and through a series of cascade events from DNA damage trying to the transcription and depression, you have an induction of pro-inflammatory cytokines and of course the recruitment of leukocytes at sites of damage which leads into the anti-inflammatory feedback loop and the onset of lipodystrophy. And of course nowadays through a lot of work or not only in my lab but in many labs out there we know that nerve factors are doing far more many things than we previously thought. They are actually sitting on promoters themselves like transcription factors and activate, they activate gene expression. They do that beyond DNA repair. So for us the question now is how exactly are we going to dissect the function and contribution of nerve factors at any tissue, any cell type and in any time point throughout the entire lifespan of a mouse? Is this uh, possible at all? So we have developed, uh, we have invested some time in my lab into tap tagging technology and we created a mouse model that has a peptide, a short peptide which is symbolized here by the letter B for biting and this particular peptide can be recognized by a bacteria like Ace specifically. Now this bacterial ligase lives as a transgene in another mouse. Now you cross the two mice and the bacterial ligase recognize specifically the peptide and bitinlates it in vivo creating a new series of mice. We call them the binary mice. And so now we can use these mouse models and using streptavidin bits we can go in any tissue for example or, or any cell type as stem cells or upon uh, genodoxic uh, uh, DNA damage or, or any other treatment you would wish and we can go for Chipsack and Maspec. And I would leave it up to here, and I would like to thank uh, my team. The work was, I described was uh, by Sminika Kassiliotti, uh, Georgina, and Irini Kamilari. Now, thank you very much.